Hagee is community-based, and 100% of the funds raised through Hagee TV Bingo stays in Thunder Bay and Northwestern Ontario. Good evening and thank you for joining us. We begin our show tonight with a $13 million commitment from the federal government to build a temporary school in Edmonton First Nation. It is a that of course comes Lisa. after the devastating fire that destroyed the John C. Yesno Education Centre last month. It left nearly 300 students between kindergarten and grade 9 without a school. Indigenous Services Minister Patty Hyde who admits the timelines will be tight if they want to get the modular units up the ice road and students ready for the fall. It is a matter of weeks. Uh, the work has begun. I have to really compliment Yabatung uh, Council and the technical experts at Matawa who worked really hard together to get us a quote that was pretty uh, detailed and so we've approved that quote. Uh, now it's a matter of just getting the logistics sorted to capitalize on the ice roads that remain. Obviously there is some contingency funding for any kind of airlift that might have to also support those uh, transfers of modular units. Haidu says the design phase for a permanent school is already underway. She estimates it could take up to three years to complete once construction begins. And we do apologize for that technical difficulty. We'll bring it back here in Thunder Bay now, where it was a very exciting night over at Fort William Historical Park. Many young athletes, their families, and members of the community gathered together for the opening ceremonies to kick off the 2024 Ontario Winter Games. Nev Van Pelt reports. 
the cold temperatures Friday night didn't stop the Thunder Bay community from showing up to cheer on hundreds of young athletes as they paraded into the opening ceremonies. The last time Thunder Bay hosted the games was 50 years ago, so it was a very special night for many, especially event chair Barry Strive. I'm peering up right now. It's what this is all about. I keep saying that to everybody that, you know, why are we doing this major event in our community? Well, it gives an opportunity for these young athletes, 12 to 18 years old, to show their talents. Many hours of work went into preparing for this moment over the past couple of years, and Special Events Chair Karen Kadoff couldn't be more pleased with all of the local support in bringing the opening ceremonies all together. She explains the significance of choosing Fort William Historical Park as their venue. We chose Fort William Historical Park because we really wanted to showcase what Thunder Bay had to offer. Um, and so these are people that are most likely coming to the city for the very first time. So we wanted them, when they're doing their sports, they're going to go around, they're going to see the different venues that we have. So we wanted to show them something that was very different than something that was very Thunder Bay. It was a very eventful night with the athletes' parade, opportunities to make your own sign, meet the official Winter Games mascot, and much more. A moment that had the crowd very excited was the lighting of the cauldron. It was a full circle moment for Zygmunt Grzeluski, who performed the lighting of the cauldron 50 years ago after winning the first gold medal of the 1974 Ontario Winter Games, and he was honoured to do it again this year. The next thing you know, they're asking me to light the torch, and of course I said yes, and it was just... I was elated to be able to do that, and do it, being able to do it again is unbelievable. I, it just brought back all those good memories, and I said, of course. The opening ceremonies will wrap up with a free concert from the Lockyer Boys, and the athletes will be back in action Saturday morning, starting with wrestling at 8.30. Nev Van Pelt, TVT News. Be sure to stick around for our sports segment later in the show where Nev Van Pelt will have all the highlights from today's action in skiing and diving. Jones Insurance is celebrating its milestone 40th anniversary, so to commemorate the occasion, the company wanted to create an initiative that would best represent how they value making connections with the community. This week, the Jones Insurance co-working corner was unveiled at Goods & Co. Market. The space is meant to encourage collaboration between entrepreneurs, students, business professionals, and newcomers to build relationships in the heart of downtown Thunder Bay. Company President Jeff Jones explains why this is the perfect location to expand their local legacy. Yes, there's a lot of parallels and synergies uh, with Jones and with Goods & Co. For us, we're looking at uh, creating collaborations and growth with partnerships with our clients, and that's exactly what Goods & Co. has done. So I think for this space here, it works as an incubator. It works as a place for people to come, meet together, get to uh, work on ventures together uh, and to feel inclusive and, and, and warm and welcome. Also at the event, Jones Insurance premiered a special 40th anniversary video as a nostalgic look back at the company's history while getting a glimpse into the future. Community members can look forward to the release of more videos in the coming months that will showcase their partnerships. In an effort to ensure that everyone can enjoy the magic of live performances, Cambrian players kicked off their Spotlight on inclusive, Inclusivity campaign earlier this week to help raise money for building access and washroom renovations. After renting spaces for almost 70 years, the theater group purchased its new home, the former Polish Hall on Spring Street, back in 2017. And while the building is functional, members say it requires retrofitting to be accessible for all patrons and volunteers. Through this campaign, the group is hoping to raise $150,000 which will go towards installing an elevator lift and a fully accessible main floor washroom. Fundraising director Ken Horton says by improving access to the facility, he's hoping to attract an even larger audience and more members and volunteers. I've had family members who uh, accessibility limitations kept them from being able to enjoy uh, everything in life, including the arts. It is non-trivial for them to be part of the Cambrian family because getting into the building and uh, being able to have the dignity of using the building and the facilities is held back from them just by nature of how it was built back in the day. And so being able to transform that and have these people be part of the theatre family, it's amazing. Donations can be made on the Cambrian Players website. The Thunder Bay Museum hosted a dual announcement on Thursday. The museum is once again hosting the Indigenous Ingenuity exhibit, while Science North officials were also on hand 
to announce the events coming up during the week-long Thunder Bay Science Festival. Jaden Billick has the story. The first part of this announcement at the Thunder Bay Museum was a celebration of the return of the Indigenous Ingenuity exhibit. This updated version, called Timeless Inventions, features a mix of science and culture documenting the diversity and interconnected resourceful ways that Indigenous knowledge and innovation of the past has provided for the local and global community. This interactive display features a hunting simulation game where players shoot arrows at different targets as well as an immersive dog sledding virtual reality video. The presentation also includes maps of different communities and displays about language and shelter. Museum Executive Director Scott Bradley says this exhibit is a great fit for them. So today is uh, kind of the uh, launch and announcement of Indigenous Ingenuity, which is being hosted by the museum on, on behalf of Science North and Indigenous Tourism Ontario. So we're very excited to have this exhibit here in our galleries. Um, you know, it's important to, to bring this sort of knowledge and history of science uh, to, to our patrons and visitors and the people of Thunder Bay. The launch of the new exhibit coincides with the start of the annual Science Festival. Science North will be at the Snow Day Celebration on Monday from 4 to 8 p.m. That's followed by several other events next week. And it all wraps up with a Science Carnival at Inner City Shopping Centre on Saturday the 24th. Yeah, today is the kickoff for our 12th annual Thunder Bay Science Festival, which is a celebration of science in our community and our region. It is a wonderful moment when we can have so many incredible things happening in our community, and we know that Indigenous knowledge is the first science, and so it's great to be able to showcase the Indigenous Ingenuity exhibit at the same time as our Thunder Bay Science Festival. Jaden Billick, TBT News. We'll head back to Fort William Historical Park, which is celebrating the winter season by hosting its annual Voyager Winter Carnival this weekend. The event is packed with family-friendly activities and entertainment, and officials are expecting to see over a thousand visitors over the two days. Jessica Clement reports. Fort William Historical Park was packed with families on Saturday for the first day of the annual Voyager Winter Carnival. The two-day event has a number of family-friendly activities on site, including a Zorb Ball track, carnival games, axe throwing, as well as crafts and demonstrations inside the buildings. A fan favorite activity was the sugar shack, where visitors were able to eat maple taffy. And then you roll it slowly, take it so slowly. Here we go. The carnival also has a number of musicians and entertainers throughout the weekend. Saturday afternoon's entertainment in the Great Hall started with a performance by string trio Café Paris. <laughs> General Manager Patrick Morash admits the lack of winter did throw them a bit of a curveball when it came to planning this year's activities. Our team here is uh, incredibly adept and flexible and uh, we were saving snow uh, while we had it, so we were stockpiling snow and protecting it very carefully so uh, the, the Sugar Shack folks could have clean snow so that we could build our castle in the front so that we could at least do some uh, snow sculpting as well. So it was a bit of a curveball. We had grand plans for a really lovely uh, skating path that was all ready to go and then Mother Nature did her thing. Uh, but we still have lots of wonderful things for everybody to take part in. Morash anticipates 1,200 to 1,400 people will come through Saturday and Sunday. We spoke to a couple visitors and asked them what their favorite part of the carnival was. Well, we've been here a bunch and it's really enjoyable. What I really uh, always done so far is the human balls and Mario was scared to go in them. Yeah. And yeah, they were really, really fun. We usually come and we get the maple taffy on a stick. The carnival will continue on Sunday from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Jessica Clement, TBT News. And we're now joined by sports anchor Josh Morano. Josh, plenty of fun over at Fort William Historical Park this weekend. But it's not the only great event going on, of course, because as we mentioned earlier in the show, the Ontario Winter Games has kicked off. Yeah, well, we had the opening ceremonies yesterday and some futsal. Love me some futsal. <laughs> and we had some more events. We'll have the details for you coming up after the break.
Welcome back. Like we were saying, Josh, an exciting weekend in Thunder Bay as the Winter Games are in full swing. That's right, Vassie. Following the opening ceremonies held at Fort William Historical Park last night, top young athletes from all over the province were back in action again today. Nev Van Pelt reports. The snow came back just in time for the 2024 Ontario Winter Games. Many of the athletes' families, as well as members from the community, braved the cold temperatures to go out and support the cross-country skiers on Saturday at Lappy Nordic Ski Centre. It was a one-kilometre qualifying race, and the top two finishers from each team on both the men's and women's side would then move on to the district relay. Local skiers Kira Hall and Palmer Hunt both had strong races in the qualifiers and were happy to have the chance to perform at home, but also felt the pressure. It was very stressful because... Um, you know, lots of people are watching, you got to perform. It means a lot because this is where I live, so it's pretty cool to have it here. I forgot to tighten my boot a bit, so I was like, oh no, that might not be the best. But it was, I like, I like starting, it's my favorite part because you just get to go super fast. It's nice because my grandma can come and my mom's here, so that's nice. Over at the Canada Games Complex, the top divers in the province were showing off their talents. They did their best to impress the judges throughout nine rounds, but only one diver on both the men's and women's side took home the precious gold medal. Forest City Diving Club's Katie Bushell had never won gold in a diving competition before, so she was very excited to end up on top. It honestly feels amazing. Like, um, it's just, it's so cool. <laughs> I don't know, like, exactly what it's going to mean in the future for me, but it definitely feels really good right now, and I'm definitely, like, if I have kids or whatever, I'm going to show them <laughs> On the men's side, Etobicoke Diving Club's Nicholas Bondi earned the honour of winning gold. This was his second time at the Ontario Winter Games, also participating back in 2018, and he was very happy to relive this experience while doing something he loves. I like the feeling of when you jump in the air and you're just floating for that little bit of time, for that half second. I feel like it's the best feeling in the world and I just always want to reach for, for that feeling right there. I'm really happy. My coach really pushes me to get my difficulty up there, and I think that's really what pushed me over the top and got me to that gold medal. It was an eventful day with many young athletes competing against each other and showcasing their talents. The games will continue throughout the rest of the weekend with all six sports in action on Sunday, and then wrapping things up with the medal rounds for futsal, badminton, and ringette on Monday. Nev Van Pelt, TBT Sports. Following the round, the local Thunder Bay cross-country ski team went on to win bronze in the district relay. Over now to some local hockey and game two between the Windsor Lancers and Lakehead Thunderwolves took place last night with the Wolves trailing in the series one to nothing. Unable to win in game one at home, the team needed to secure two wins on the road to keep their championship dreams alive. Picking up early in the first, Lancers on the hunt. Mason Kahn in the neutral zone finds a streaking Jake Durham. Look at the move plus the finish. Durham's second of the playoffs gives the Lancers the early one goal lead just over a minute into the contest. Five minutes later, Wolves with a chance. Look at Liam Whitaker here as he circles the entire Lancers zone, pulls the puck back before heading towards the net. The initial pass attempt is stopped, but Whitaker sticks with it and pops his rebound. What an individual effort from the D-man. His second of the series makes this a new game. Still in the first, Windsor looking to regain their lead. Brady Hines throws this puck on Max Wright. He has trouble with the rebound, and Keegan McMullen's there to clean it up, taking out Wright in the process, but it does not matter after one, Lancer's up two to one. Second period now, the puck is bumbled at the Lancer line, sending in Olivier Pouliot all alone, and he zips this one past the big Nathan Torquia. What a perfect shot to knot this game up at twos. However, it was all Lancers from there, and this one is not what you need in a tie game. Dominic Mufare just past the blue line. He's going to get this one and just simply throw it on net, and oof, Max Wright unable to get the glove on that one as he just whiffs it. It gets by him nonetheless, and Windsor restore their one-goal lead. Still in the second, Lancers keep pressing. They break into the Wolves' zone on a four-on-two. Puck finds his way to Barrett DeShane, and he rips it as Windsor would eventually end the Thunderwolves season, winning this one by a score of 7-2. The 2024 Scotties got underway last night in Alberta, and Thunder Bay legend Krista McCarville and her team are there representing Team Northern Ontario as they took on British Columbia's Team Brown in draw one action. Skipping ahead to the fourth end, Team McCarville up 3-1 following a double steal in the third, getting another chance for the steal here if Brown can't get a rock on the heart. Brown's rock coming in, but maybe not enough steam behind it. Fourth, Karen Brown trying to finesse this one in, but the scatter from Team McCarville just too much to handle as Team Northern Ontario would get another double steal. They would go up 5-1 to one after the fourth end. Over now to the sixth, McCarville up 7-1 now. 
Basically the same situation, 14 Brown with the hammer, needing anything to get some points back on the board. This one coming in much hotter, but maybe a little too much power behind it, as their rock would eventually fall out, and McCarvel and her team would get another steal to go up 8-1 to one through 6. And after 9 ends, McCarvel would get the win, defeating Team Brown by a score of 9-5. to five. McCarvel is back in action tonight in draw 3 action, taking on Kerry Anderson, led Team Canada squad. Over now to the PWHL, where Toronto hosted Montreal in a battle of the top teams in the league. And no, this one not taking place at the usual Matami Arena. It was a special night for the PWHL and their fans playing inside a sold-out Scotiabank Arena. With the Maple Leafs in between games, Toronto's PWHL team is keeping the ice uh, cool, I guess, as they host the Montreal franchise in the so-called Battle of Bay Street. Kia Nurse there to drop the puck, but let's get right into the action. Early in the second period, Toronto on the attack. Puck rolls out front, but goaltender and Rene Debien is there to make the sensational stop. Team Canada's usual starting netminder, keeping this a scoreless game with the help of a defensive stick. Later in the period, Marie-Philippe Poulain with a full head of steam. Look at the move. Schwink! She beats her defender, but can't get this one to the back of the net. Poulain with six goals in nine games, just unable to solve Toronto's goalie. We remain scoreless. In the third now, let's get some goals. Brittany Howard in behind. She throws it out front to Jesse Comfer, who roofs it. Comfer's first of the season gets a sellout crowd on their feet. One to nothing Toronto. Ten minutes later, Toronto's still up. Hannah Miller with a 34 on her back, looking like Austin Matthews out there last night. She slings this one low short side and in, as Toronto would eventually score on an empty net, and they win this one three to nothing. I think when you see the number up there, obviously, it's in the middle of a game, but for a quick second, I know personally I looked at it and I was like, wow, that's really special, and it's really cool to be a part of history. Looking back, this is definitely uh, the coolest birthday that I've had in, uh, ever, probably, so... Um, pretty special and, and happy we got the win. Well, it's so special to see the amount of signs in the stands, to see little girls, little boys, families coming up. It, it's unbelievable. It's what's happening with women's hockey right now. It's surreal and we all take it in with a big smile. Obviously, uh, Sarah Nurse has changed the game all around and obviously good, getting to do that opening face off with her, with her cousin Kia uh, is very special. Uh, those are the moments that you look at each other and like, wow, we did it. As mentioned, the Maple Leafs are back in action tonight. They host the Anaheim Ducks at Scotiabank Arena, trying to extend their two-game winning streak. Morgan Riley remains out, and the Buds once again will be without captain John Tavares, who is out with a minor injury, and defenseman Mark Giordano. Martin Jones also gets the call in between the pipes tonight. Uh, well, just, just to kind of break, break it up, um, break up Sammy's workload. Uh, you know, when we leave today... We'll have a practice tomorrow and we play a 12 o'clock game in St. Louis and then a back-to-back -back upcoming here. So I um, thought it was a good time to, to have a different goaltender in tonight uh, just to break that workload. Just that way Sammy would end up getting two of the next three after this, uh, where if he played tonight uh, with the quick turnaround for the 12 o'clock, it probably starts to get too much from here. So it's less about tonight, just more so kind of forecasting ahead, but also, you know, it's... Uh, Two games already for Sammy this week and, and a busy uh, stretch coming. Four minutes and playing that line. Uh, yeah, obviously it's a good opportunity. Um, <laughs> any chance uh, guys are in the lineup, obviously it's, it's, it's actually the worst they're playing, but um, it's kind of the next man on mentality and you know, we have to adapt to the window, so I'm looking forward to the afternoon. 45 goals in 51 games for Austin Matthews. There is talk. I, I don't know if he's going to do it again tonight, get another hat trick, but there is talks of him potentially hitting 70 this year. I don't think it's going to happen. You don't think? 60 is like almost certain yeah. at this point, yeah. I believe. I think 65 would be just absolutely incredible. I think we talked about this a couple weeks ago. Where yeah. just like, I never thought I'd see a 65 goal score in my yeah. lifetime. I thought that was kind of gone with the old days of hockey, but... You could do it. Yeah. And tonight should be a McDavid almost easy got, game. McDavid almost got 65 last year, but... That's true. Yeah, yeah he's pretty impressive. He, he's, he's okay. He's caught he's it right there. Second best player in the world. Okay. And uh, <laughs> let's take it back to earlier in the show where we gave you what, let's call it a weather tease mm. a little earlier. You probably saw there's some snow coming to the region. We're going to have the full forecast after the break.
Welcome back. Like I was saying, Josh, we're getting some snow across the region overnight, which is exactly where we're going to start out in the northwest, the western portions of our region, getting some lighter snow overnight, not as much out on the east where the Greenstone Marathon area should be getting a few centimeters, two to three overnight. The chilliest part of the region is going to be Pickle Lake at minus 17. Armstrong and Greenstone aren't far behind. Their lows are minus 15. As you look along the North Shore, minus 12s for Nipigon Marathon, Atacokan, and working their way up to Dryden and Kenora, lows of 12 as well. Looking tomorrow, the sun's peaking out in the western portions of the region. Red Lake's got a high of minus 10. Quite a bit warmer out in Kenora at minus 7. Fort Francis along the border there, all the way up to minus 5. But as we make our way east in the region, that snow is going to be sticking around in the Greenstone Marathon and Armstrong area. Minus 11 is the high in Greenstone. Minus 9's in Armstrong, Nipigon, and Marathon. Let's head off to currently in Thunder Bay. It's mostly cloudy, minus 4, but the wind chill's making it feel more like minus 11. And that wind chill is going to be a factor over the next few days for sure. Let's look ahead to our overnight drop, minus 9. That wind chill making it feel all the way down to minus 18. A few clouds in the sky. You can expect some flurries overnight as well.